Hi, my name is Dr. Michael Moses from NYU Lango Medical Center, and we're presenting a video on the technique for endoscopic proximal partial hamstring repair. Proximal hamstring injuries commonly occur in athletes and are typically due to disruption at the proximal belly of the muscle or at the myotendinous junction. 12% of these injuries represent a tear or avulsion of the proximal attachment at the ischial tuberosity. Tears can either be partial or full thickness, with partial tears comprising a significantly smaller portion of these injuries. Proximal hamstring injuries are debilitating and negatively impact athletic performance and quality of life. In order to better understand the exact pathology of these tears, comprehension of the anatomy of the hamstrings is critical. The hamstring muscle group comprises three muscles, the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, and the biceps femoris, which includes the long and the short head. The semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and long head of the biceps all originate on the ischial tuberosity. The semitendinosus and semimembranosus insert on the medial aspect of the tibia. The long head of the biceps inserts on the fibular head. The short head of the biceps femoris originates on the linea aspera of the femur and inserts on the fibular head. The hamstrings function as biarticular muscles, meaning that they function across two joints, the hip and the knee. They are innervated by the sciatic nerve and function in hip extension and in knee flexion. On this slide, you can see the cadaveric anatomy of the hamstring muscles. Notably, you can see the origin of the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and long head of the biceps femoris at the ischial tuberosity. There are multiple classification systems for hamstring injuries. Grade 1 represents an overstretching but minimal loss of the structural integrity of the muscle tendon unit. Grade 2 represents a partial tear, which is the focus of this case. Grade 3 represents a total rupture of the hamstring muscle. Partial hamstring injuries comprise a small portion of proximal hamstring tears and are elusive and in particular may be difficult to evaluate on imaging. Most commonly, there is an avulsion of the common semitendinosus and biceps origin with the semimembranosus remaining intact. Partial tears without retraction can be seen on MRI, as evidenced in the image. This is represented as a sickle sign, seen by the white arrow. The patient in this case is a 45-year-old female presenting with left hip pain. The patient is a fitness instructor and has had left hip pain for the past seven months prior to presentation. The patient has difficulty completing her activities of daily living and participating as a fitness instructor. Her physical exam at the time of presentation was notable for tenderness palpation of the left proximal hamstring. Her range of motion at the hip was 0 to 90 degrees with painful flexion greater than 100 degrees. She had buttock pain with internal and external rotation of the hip. She had a positive Faber test. MRI imaging obtained preoperatively demonstrated a high-grade partial thickness tear of the proximal hamstring tendon with tendon separation from the ischial tuberosity. Treatment for partial proximal hamstring injuries is mainly dictated by the severity of the injury. There are two main separations for treatment options, mainly conservative and surgical. Conservative treatment is typically employed for low-grade partial tears. Conservative treatment encompasses active rest, NSAIDs, physical therapy, and possible corticosteroid injections. For patients that are unresponsive to conservative measures or who have high-grade partial thickness tears, surgical treatment is typically employed. The two surgical options are open and endoscopic repair of the proximal hamstring. The main benefit that endoscopic repair offers is that it may reduce morbidity and complications associated with open procedures. Indications for surgical repair are high-grade partial proximal hamstring tear, a tear unresponsive to conservative measures, usually three to six months of conservative treatment that has failed for the patient, or more than two centimeter retraction of at least two tendons. Relative contraindications for surgical repair include limited surgeon familiarity with anatomy and technique, chronic tears with extensive scarring, and a high surgical risk patient. There's a paucity of data in the current literature regarding partial proximal hamstring repair and clinical outcomes. A study from 2006 reported on an open repair of 48 cases of partial proximal hamstring injury. They noted positive results after open surgical repair of these tears. 
Additionally, in 2013, a case series of 17 patients with partial thickness tears of the proximal hamstring were identified. All tears were repaired with an open surgical technique. At a mean follow-up of 32 months, all returned to preoperative function. There are solely case reports regarding endoscopic repair, which has emerged as a viable treatment option for these types of injuries. In 2013, Dom et al. described the surgical technique for endoscopic repair of proximal hamstring avulsion. There have only been a few other case reports regarding the endoscopic technique for proximal hamstring tears. Potential complications of proximal hamstring repair using the endoscopic technique include damage to neurovascular structures, specifically the sciatic nerve during portal placement or during debridement, fluid extravasation into the pelvis, pressure points or neuropraxia depending on the length of surgery and patient positioning, and wound complications or infection. A standard operating room table is utilized and the patient is positioned prone. Fluoroscopy enters the surgical field from the contralateral side. The operative extremity is also slightly abducted to protect the sciatic nerve. The palpable ischial tuberosity is utilized for portal placement in addition to fluoroscopic visualization. The two subsequent portals are marked at approximately 4 cm medial and 2 cm superior for the medial portal and 4 cm lateral and 2 cm superior for the lateral portal. We then used fluoroscopic images to localize the portals to the ischial tuberosity, signifying the origin of the conjoint tendon. A 30 degree scope was then introduced in the medial portal. Ischial bursa is seen with notable bursitis surrounding the ischial tuberosity. Location of the shaver was confirmed with fluoroscopy to avoid any neurovascular injury. The shaver was used to perform an ischial bursectomy. Once we completed the ischial bursectomy with the shaver, adhesions were removed in order to identify the origin of the conjoint tendon on the ischial tuberosity. A probe was inserted and used to identify the laminated portion of the conjoint tendon where the high-grade partial thickness tear was seen. The probe was also used to identify the defect in the hamstring tendon and the shaver was used to remove bursa for further visualization. The tendon was then split where the high-grade undersurface partial tear was identified. Delamination is visualized as well on the inferior portion of the screen. The shaver was again utilized to clear soft tissue from the ischial tuberosity. A burr was then used for decortication and to obtain bleeding bone for repair. An 8.5 mm cannula was then inserted for anchor placement. This was placed lateral to the scope. An anchor was then inserted and sutures from the anchor were passed using a suture shuttle device into a mattress configuration through medial and lateral leaflets of the tendon in preparation for repair. Here you can see the side-to-side -side repair as the sutures are passed through the medial and lateral leaflets of the tendon. Arthroscopic knots were used to tie down the tendon to the bone. This is a double loaded anchor, and at this time, a second set of sutures were passed through the tendon for repair. The sciatic nerve may be identified lateral to the ischium in the abducted position if there is concern for decompression and need for neurolysis. Protection of the nerve, however, is necessary for every case. As mentioned prior, abduction of the operative limb can help protect the nerve. Additionally, if the nerve must be identified, adequate hemostasis must be achieved through electrocautery or epinephrine in the fluid. Another anchor was then inserted for further repair and fixation of the delaminated tissue. A self-retrieving suture lasso device was used to pass suture through each leaflet for a mattress type repair. A knot pusher was used to push the knot down to the tendon. 
We then probed the repair to assess if further anchors were needed. We noted that we had strong fixation at this time. The wound was subsequently irrigated, cleaned, and dressed. The patient was discharged from the hospital with instructions regarding foot flat weight bearing with a hip abduction brace locked in full extension while standing. The hip and knee were also kept in 90 degrees of flexion while sitting. She utilized two crutches for assistance while ambulating. During her post-operative appointments, progressive range of motion of the hip was employed. At two weeks, she began physical therapy and transitioned to partial weight bearing at 50%. At six weeks, she began weight bearing as tolerated and began to focus on full hip range of motion exercises. At three months, she continued to progress with full hip range of motion. At six months, the patient had progressed well with her rehabilitation protocol. She continued her hamstring strengthening exercises and returned to full hip range of motion without any pain. At this point, she returned to her pre-injury activity level with no limitations for her work as a fitness instructor. Hamstring injuries commonly occur in athletes. Partial tears in this region are difficult to discern on imaging and high clinical suspicion must be utilized when making this diagnosis. Treatment for partial tears range from non-operative to operative depending on the grade and symptomatology associated with the injury. Endoscopic repair of proximal hamstring injuries is emerging as a viable, safe, and effective means of restoring function and quality of life in patients with these partial proximal hamstring tears. Continued research as well as surgeon familiarity with this procedure will allow further integration into clinical practice.